<laughs> okay. <good>. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Okay, let's begin. Okay, okay. Thank you, uh, Danny, for this uh, uh, nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you. And so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I will currently, uh, I used to work at the US Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Lab like for 15 years, as Daniel introduced to me. I currently work at uh, Old Domain University in Norfolk, Virginia, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so my topic you can see here is uh, energy renewal, okay? Isothermal utilization of environmental heat energy uh, with a symmetric function. So the key words are isothermal, right? Okay, you know, if you have a temperature gradient, of course, everybody knows how to use it, right? <laughs> so key words, isothermal utilization. Uh -huh. So my talk, basically we identify there are um, another type of energy process. I now kind of call it, as a type of B energy processes. Okay, so uh, we identify they actually have two thermodynamically distinct type of processes naturally occurring on Earth. Okay, we'll, we'll give you an example of that. Huh? Now type A, such as ATP synthesis or the classic heat engine process, everybody of course for very familiar with this. Uh, they apparently follow the second law very, very well, okay? So we already talked about that in the morning as well. Now the type B process, that natural occurring on Earth, I'm gonna give an example of it, uh, exemplified by these thermophilic functions with transmembering electrostatic localized protons. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this. Does not necessarily have to be constrained by the second law or into its special thermodynamic symmetric function. That's really the key words here, okay? So whenever you have a symmetric process, be careful, don't apply the second law blindly. <laughs> yeah, you can do it, but if you do that, you'll miss many important things. That's my message here, okay? So I'm gonna uh, talk about how we discover this type of B or identify type B, okay? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, now we actually initially, I'm was actually not trying to looking for uh challenge the second law or try to um, you know discover you know this type B actually was discovered in a sense pretty unexpected. <laughs> um like about 10 years ago, even like 35 years ago, and um when 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 I was a PhD student, we were uh, very interesting the you know the bioenergetic, you know, the Peter Mitchell's theory. Uh, it describes how our ATP is made in terms of called the chemi osmotic theory, right? She, you are not very prized for it. But there's a lot of debate whether protons are localized or delocalized. Some of the observation cannot be explained by his theory. <laughs> Although he got no very prized for it. He, he, he really made a great uh, contribution of it. But uh, we discovered that his theory is not entirely correct. I'll show you why. Mm -hmm. So now, so the thing is actually everybody uh, understand was there's a, a, it's like a, a problem that the theory, the, you know, the textbook um, bioenergetic theory by proposed by Peter Mitchell cannot explain the bioenergetics. It's actually one of them very clear example is on the uh, aquifilic bacteria. Now these bacteria can grow at pH as high as 10.5, even 11, <laughs> okay. Now, so um, the inside the cell, you know, these people have to measure, those are the data, it's not serial. These are experimental measurement, okay, right? Those are the population data, okay? People measuring in the last 30 years, okay? The inside the pH is uh, 8.2, and now in bacteria, similar to our mitochondria, we can talk about later, there are respiration systems in the membrane. So these are biological membranes. So this is a bacterial cell membrane, okay? So this is the outside, this inside the cell. The entire cell, this pH is 8.2. So it's normal, uh, just like us. <laughs> now these bacteria have respiration system in natural nodes, well defined, uh, well known. Uh, when you use organic materials, oxide, oxygen, you pump in electron and pump, you know, so the electron uh, moment is coupled with uh, proton pumping. This is a well-known mechanic, it's no theory, okay? It's, it's a fact, basically not exact fact. Everybody knows, okay? Pumping protons out. Now the proton is supposed to come here 
drive ATP making, this called ATP synthesis, is actually a nanometer turbine. Uh, the structure as well is not also getting the very possible after we, the um, professor um, Paul Boyer at uh, UCLA actually, he proposed the CAD and also the people resolved the structure of it. Actually, well, you know, uh, recently also got the bare power. So this process is well known. It's like a little turbine here makes a turn, and then actually, um, when the proton come in here and drive the ATP making from ADP plus the inorganic phosphate, and then uh, when this uh, low time movings convert the mechanical energy into your ATP energy. So that's a well known process. Okay, now the key here is that. You look here, now you're supposed to have proton pumping here, right? But look outside, the pH is 10.5. You have very lower proton gradient, is that right? The, you, have, you have less pH proton here than inside, right? Inside the pH is 8.2. You have more proton in the medium, in the buck, right? So now we use, now, so these equations are in the textbook uh, based on Peter Mitchell's, uh, Mitchell's uh, called the proton module force equation. Now, in short, we call the PMA, okay? So the proton motive force equation, okay? So that's what he uh, defined, that's in the textbook. So is the membrane potential for this bacteria 180? That is a water different bit, uh, across the membrane here, okay? So is, now, here is a pol outside positive, here negative. So it's 100, uh, the, the water difference. So we, we in the bioenergetic, this uh, is called the membrane potential. Now, according to Mitchell's hypothesis is, you know, the proton concentration or the pH, um, the difference from outside to inside, okay? Now outside 10.5 and you, you minus that 2.3, right, okay? So this 59 is just a constant, you know, like RT constant, okay, right? And uh, that's a you know, temperature. So if you calculate with the textbook equation, the proton module force only 44 millivolts. How much you required to drive ATP making? you require 478 millivolts. So if I use like three or four protons, you're not enough. So this is like, everybody knows this in the field of bioenergetics. It's so like an elephant in a room. <laughs> you know, the textbook equation cannot explain for 30 years, people have no way to, uh, to explain this. So like this is a conjurma, you know, this mystery happens there like in for 30 years. Then, I'm coming in. <laughs> so, so the idea is actually this. Mm -hmm. So basically the textbook cannot explain the energetic, how you can make ATP. You know, the bacteria grew very, very well, okay? <laughs> I'll tell you about more. Uh -huh. So uh, we, I'm coming in here, you know, water, right? Is um, can understand as a protonic conductor for these two reasons. You know, these are water molecules, so the proton can hop like this, okay, between among water molecules. Another way water can act the protonic conduction, you know, water molecule turn a little bit here, that way there, and this, that, that. And in a sense, proton in liquid water, some water behavior, some water uh, similar to the Electrons, you know, the, the, the Fermi level electrons on the metal, right? Okay. They, they can kind of, you know, if you, if you have electrical field or something, they kind of conduct. Basically, that's why we call the protonic conduct, right? Of course, water does not conduct electrons, though, but only to the proton, right? So this is proper to call water as a protonic conductor, of course, the insulator for electrons. Make sure that we understand that, okay, right? Now you understand water is a protonic conductor. Now let's go back to the visit to the case here. You have water here, of course, outside the cell, right? You have protonic conductor. Your membrane is insulated, right? Okay, right? And inside the cell, you have water, protonic conductor. So you have a conductor, insulator, conductor. By definition, you have a, a protonic capacitor. You got it? Now, so that what happens, the proton pumping across the membrane by the respiration will not go to the bulk, but form this protonic capacitor. Uh -huh. This has been never understood or recognized before. So we are the one first uh, about 10 years ago, uh, recognize, understand it, recognize this. 
So this basically is a protonic capacitor, uh, similar to electric capacitor. In that case, the actor is electro, but in this case, it's a protonic protons, okay? Now, if you Google the words protonic capacitor, it does not find it, because that words I created. If you protonic capacitor, James, this name will popping up in Google, okay? So, so we are the first one to understand that. So now if you understand how there's a layer of proton here, you see that, right? This proton will be just on the liquid world membrane interfaces are sitting there. They are thermally vibrating. We'll talk more sorry about that. They're gonna hit that thing and do the work, right? <laughs> then you calculate this, then as actually the whole thing making sense, you know? So, but you need a modified equation because the textbook equation never talk about it. They're not, uh, they, they're not, they are not aware of there's a something like this going on. Uh -huh. So what will be the correct uh, proton multiverse equations? So, so that's really here. Now remember, this is the maturing proton multiverse equation in the textbook. Okay, so it's PMF membranes are 2.3 RT, okay? Faraday constant times the pH difference across the membrane. So that's uh, in the textbook. So, uh, so this is my modified um, revised proton uh, multiverse equations. Now, the first two terms here, you see, this is the same. This term is essentially the same as that, just a different way of writing it. Remember, pH is minus uh, log, okay, of the proton concentration, right? That's right here, okay. So this is on the proton on the pizza outside, uh, over the proton constant in the bulk face, okay. And in the inside, so these these two terms are identical to what in the text. But um, the what the uh, the textbook equation misses this term. So that's a term I added. So here is you know is two point three log uh, RT you know gas constant you know environmental temperature. So it's actually this term is the one here uh, with um, the you know the layer. Um, for on the surface, right? Electrostatic localized, I use called the localized, I use L here. So the localized proton concentration on that layer, protonic ca capacitor, okay? And over the bulk phase in the liquid, you know, not the same thing with that one here, okay? And it's this ratio that contributed to so called, uh, this component actually uh, later we call, uh, call the localized proton, PM, proton. Uh, module force, okay? So well, this is very important. I want you to recognize that. Now the question is, yeah, you have uh, you have a same layer, but what the density of this, you know? Yeah, so we, this is basically, we're talking about this kind, this layer is a monolayer actually. So you typically will stay within one nanometer, not too far, okay? So you have a, you have a kind of population density. So I call this called a localized proton density, okay? I describe as, this proton little sub L here, okay? So that's just a bulk, you know, just like in water, okay? In the water. So the question is, what is it? Are we able to quantitatively express this thing? If we know the quantitative, we can, then you can calculate things. You can calculate energy, right? So the proton motive force is, uh, you know, if we time this become, uh, you know, basically become converted to data G, right? So, in the field of bioenergetic, people use proton multiverse like millivolts. So that's what we are using. I'm going to actually convert to give us uh, energy later. Okay, it's, it's a simulation on that. Okay. Uh huh. So my idea of to try to define or to quantitatively express this thing here actually came from here. So we understand the protonic capacity. Okay, now if protonic cell capacitor, you know, we should able to borrow you know, electric capacitor equation to use here, right? That's the whole idea, okay? When we understand capacity, okay? So then we evolve, basically borrow the well-known, um, you know, capacity equation, right? So the concentration of the local proton, I put a zero, zero here. Zero means like if in a pure water system, okay? Just like ideal gas, so let's start from simple. <laughs> Not consider the salt, we'll consider the salt effect later, okay? Otherwise, Human, you know, too much things just like cannot let this thing through. Okay. So if you in an idealized um, liquid water membrane water system, then you will have this, you can apply this if there are membrane potentials. Uh, it will be the the you uh, the you know the specific membrane capacitance time your 
your voltage difference, you know, membrane potential code, and uh, divided by your the thickness of that layer, about one nanometer, and then the factory constant. That will be your idealized localized proton concentration defined. Now, so that's good. But in actual biology, you have a salt, right? We eat a lot of sodium. So in our body, we have a plenty of salt, you know, sodium uh, chloride or potassium, you know, <laughs> there's many things there, okay? So we also further developed the, um, uh, a term to call the reduction factor, the equation to accounting for that. So make the story short, to accounting that effect, we use the Leo uh, local proton concentration in the presence of those uh, non-proton cation, including you know, this here, you know, M means like uh, uh, cation, it could be sodium, um, uh, potassium, magnesium, all those um, are in your body or in the you know, outside, inside the cell, okay? They can affect, they can exchange, okay? Because they are, they are proton, right? They can exchange. If we have sodium here, they can, if you have a large amount of sodium, you can exchange this, uh, um, uh, proton out into the bulk phases. Okay, that's really that term for for that. Okay, so when this proton exchange, you have a sodium occupied here. Of course, the density of the the uh, proton concentration will reduce, right? So that's I call that is this term basically is a reduction factor. So is actually the effect is not summation. We figured out is actually is a product like each different for you have a sodium uh, exchange. With the proton and you have potassium, those effects are not additive but products, very important. Okay, so that's why this little symbol here means all those terms are product together, then we'll be correct accounting for that. So, this is very important, otherwise, you know, the calculation will be all wrong. <laughs> okay, very important. So, we divide this is unique. Um, uh, so you can see already published. Okay, I already published this thing. Now with that, if you know the true concentration of, now you can use this sign to a uh, real world system. So this is the uh, system now. So we apply this, uh, use experimental data. These are people who have done that. So the real experimental data, okay. So now in the culture medium, all the uh, non proto cation concentration like sodium, it's known 300 minimal in the culture media. So those are clone experiment, okay? From, you know, it's real facts, no, no theory, okay? Sodium, uh, potassium, no magnesium, all the evidence known, okay? So we use real experimental data for this culture in experiment. And so I know. And uh, another thing is we need to know in order to calculate that exchange equipment um, um, concentration, we Need this uh, called the exchange equipment constant. Now that thing was not available. <laughs> so actually, took my uh, uh, my PhD student like five years to measure this uh, these two constant. Okay, <laughs> you know, a long time. Okay, so that's why you know we we know this thing. You know, in, I'm still ex, ex, uh, explore this thing in 2010 or 11. It took like a five years, and then finally we got this number. And then we can calculate. You know this thing, okay? This uh, uh, reduction factor. So, so this is the case. Like in potassium, you see that, right? So, is this uh, fact here? For potassium, is a reduction factor in this concentration. That your potassium, the reduction factor that, and uh, for magnesium, kind of small, equal close to one. So, the very low concentration, guys, almost to one. So, the total effect is not summation. Is time this all together? You have actually very significant reduction factor. Okay, you see that, right? Uh, 44 thousand, right? Okay, yeah. So that's for um, the culture media at pH 10.5. So we have to do each of those uh, pHs, uh, culture pH, um, uh, separately. Okay, so because this culture has to be done, the people culture uh, scientists culture these bacteria at different pHs. Okay. So 10.5 is a number I just show you, right? Okay. So we did, of course, this bacteria can also grow at 7.5. At that time, the reduction factor is this, okay? So on, okay? Now, so this is the uh, H local proton, you know, like idealized condition. We actually can use the capacity to calculate, okay? The membrane potential are measured experimentally, okay? These are experimental, all those are experimental data, okay? 
Now, these are calculated from memory potential. So it's also in the same style from a based on experiment, okay? So these are not like a proposed numbers, okay? Those are the calculated factors. Now use that, you know, calculate the real localized proton concentration, okay, right? So this is here. Now when, in, when this uh, localized proton concentration is, you know, is here, then the less of the home free, you can calculate the local proton motor force. That's the, the third term in my equation, okay? Now the classic proton motor force is based on the textbook, you know, the first two terms. <laughs> And the total proton motive forces is two together. That's your total. You see that, right? Yeah. Now, so let's plot this out. You're making sense of it. Okay, so I'm plotting this data out. Now you will see it. So this work is already published in the ACC journal. Okay. Now, so this axis is the proton motive force, and that's your cultural medium pHs. Okay. So now the culture able to glue this a cell doubling times on this axis. So the cell doubling times like it how long it takes in the cell for making a cell division, making you know one become two, right? Four become uh, two become uh, four, four become eight, eight become you know sixteen, right? The doubling time, okay? So you can see this bacteria. So the doubling time of the minute here. You know, this culture you know, can grow from pH 7.5 all the way pH about 11 here. The doubling time is like a below 100 minutes. So like this cell is not slow. <laughs> you know, every two hours, you know, doubles, okay, right? Very grow, very, uh, this cell actually grow, excellent growth. So now when the, when the pH go higher further and then the doubling time significantly go up, okay? <laughs> That's what was observed, those experiment observations. So you look at the, the textbook uh, uh, proton motive force equation calculator, the proton motive force, you know, the, called a the classic um, PMF, you see? Now on 10, P10.5, you see, your proton motive force is about 44. How much is required to make ATP for the proton? You need at least 110 or 20. So you have four together, or four together, you were able to meet a lot about 400, you see that, right? That's why, you know, that's why like for the last 30 years, nobody able to explain this. And this is totally unexplainable with the textbook equation, right? It's the last 30 years sitting there, okay? Now, when you look at that, this, this also the pattern of the, of the classic uh, proton motor force doesn't make any sense here. Now, then the pH equal actually go down, right? And then from this point, like pH, you know, from here, you go to 11 and, uh, uh, called close to 12, you see the proton motive was actually increased. Now, increase your cells doubling time should be getting smaller, you know, not like bending up. You see that the curve should be bending down, right? So the, not only is the absolute value that's not able to make, doesn't make any sense with observe the true doubling pattern, but also the pattern of the match. You see that, that's why this, <laughs> This thing really cannot explain by the textbook as uh, Peter Mitchell's um, theory, okay, per se, okay? So now the reason why, it missed the term I discovered. It's the local proton moments. They are here <laughs> and you calculate it, okay? You see that the, 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 the miscomponent, the miscomponent actually much bigger than the classic one here. So it's not miss a small thing. It's a big component, you know, the layer of proton on the surface, you know, the protonic capacity thing, right? Okay. So the total is these two together. That's your total. So it's way here. Okay. <laughs> so now you look at this one here as pH go up. Yeah, the proton motive force actually go down. The reason is when the pH go high, the, the, the proton concentration in the bulk liquid phase go down. So the favors the pro cation proton exchange. That's why you have this, uh, the localized proton uh, concentration go down so that of course the localized uh, PMF component also decrease, right? So you can see here, uh, and that's go down, but still above this minority quite. So you can explain this, that, that's why this thing is still able to glue. <laughs> but when it go down, you see, they are have more difficult to double, you see? So now matches. So the proton total proton modes like this go down, and the, the doubling time go up means grow slow, right? So now it's the first, first time this 30 years mystery 
have been solved in terms of bioenergetics, okay? In like, uh, why uh, now we cannot explain how, the, how this bacteria can grow, okay? They have to have enough energy. <laughs> you can see that because the, the total proton motive force is well above that, okay? So that's good. Initially, that's my only purpose. I try to explain you know, how this thing can grow, or how this can make ATP, right? Charts on that mystery. But now you look, I want to pay attention to here. Now these 220 millivolts or 228 or 230 millivolts called uh, the redox potential energy limit. What this came from? Now in our mitochondria, you know, all, all the bacteria, they use uh, electron, right? Uh, 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 um, free electron, okay? Like NADH, okay? Or, or this organic uh, um, uh, uh, substrate. So oxide to oxygen, but that redox potential energy, amount of chemical energy available is known. It's about close to about, um, uh, so the redox potential from, for example, NADH to oxygen, you know, this whole chain, is about 1100 millivolts. Okay, so you develop, so we know that for each electron, uh, each electron goes through, they are pumping five protons. So 1100 divided by five, you know, about 220 something, right? That's this chemical energy. So that's your like, even you're assuming like 100% energy efficiency, you convert all the food <laughs> you eat to chemical energy, right? That should be a glass ceiling, right? Should not have a proton motor force, should be higher than that, right? So initially, when this is about seven or eight years ago, when I first observed, I thought maybe this is my calculations law, my equations law, I check everything. <laughs> What's correct? And then I think about well, exactly where the energy came from. You know, this thing is well above the energy you put in, your chemical energy, right? Even 100% efficiency. You should know higher than that. So this high is not a little bit, right? You know, a factor of two here. <laughs> and so then suddenly the story, I, my early work in um, during my college years, like that's like 40 years ago in 1979 and 1980, I was actually doing a student project to explore the question of whether this uh, somophilic uh, kind of somotrophic property or somotrophic is kind of type of life is possible. That means is it the heat energy in the environment can be used by life to making science or to do work. So actually, if I have time, I will cover that. Actually, I did that. And then I'll say, ha ha, this thing is the thing actually I was looking for this maybe 30, 40 years ago. I'll kind of put aside <laughs> because all my professors, when I came to US at Cornell, my old medical professor, they all say, hey, James, <laughs> you know, uh, environment heat cannot utilize, uh, you know, the thermal traffic uh, things, you know, if you want to do that, we cannot advise you. <laughs> so I just learned, if you know, chemistry, you know, working for development energy, all classic, you know, <laughs> traditional energy. <laughs> so I kind of already possess that aside, you know, all those, uh, you know, very uh, conventional research. And until now, I realized, aha, uh -huh, that's a thermal thing here, because it must be thermal. Okay. So I carefully look. Now, so you look at the, this component, you know, the localized um, proton motor force, right? You remember this is a local, you know, that, that, that one miss, okay? So it's a concentration of your localized proton versus the one in the, in the bulk phases actually contributed to your free energy. You know, this local uh, proton motor force actually have, you know, as a simple relation become a data G, right? At first, I'm gonna explain that, okay? So the, in a sense, the protonic motor force for this is just a time, you know, you, you just um, uh, time your Faraday constant for this one time Faraday, you cancel that one, that's it. So, so clear, okay, right? So because I have a, you know, it's a, it's a minus Faraday constant time, your proton motor force become a, um, gives free energy. So it's right there, aha. Uh -huh. But you look at that. Now, where the heat energy come from? They're hiding right here, RT. So in this audience, I know, I think, you know, um, you know, the R is the uh, Boltzmann constant times Avogadro's number, right? You have a KT term hiding right there. <laughs> so is the thermal energy your by in equation tells here? <laughs> you see, it's use this KT term, it's hiding there. In the past, we just kind of 
oh, gas constant, we just take for granted. That's not really thinking very hard. <laughs> so I immediately realized this actually, now the temperature, remember, inside the cell, outside the cell is the same. There's no temperature gradient here inside outside cell, okay? So that's really truly isosomal. So that's why the single T, okay? Yeah, so I go, so that's why we now understand that this really is, um, is the energies came from this term called the local proton motive force, I call the local protonic motive force, where it came from. Now we can also define, um, we actually find out the entropy change actually shown here for this localized proton is can be shown by this equation here. You see, right? You divide by T here, you got that, okay? And that's actually the ratio of the local proton over proton, uh, the concentration in the bulk phase, you know, in the bulk liquid, okay, uh, of the of this system. Basically, is this your uh, electro uh, transmembrane electrostatic local protons versus the bulk phase protons is related to called negative entropy change. Theta is L is mathematically now defined. So now this is very important. So that says that now, as long as you have your local protonic capacity behavior, that all biological memory actually has, very important, all biological, I'm talking about not only this bacteria, including our mitochondria, I'm gonna cover later, or in the trees, in the algae, or in the trees, in the oceans, uh -huh. in your homes, in everywhere when you have a life, you have these things, okay? So what happened here? Well, as long as you have this, so this will be, is if this, as long as it's not zero, now if zero here, a logarithm of one becomes zero, right? Your potential will be changed to zero. As long as this is not zero, above zero, you have a, you have an active entropy change. You see that, right? So this is happening. <laughs> so this really, you know, the first time we mathematically or uh, scientifically discovered the natural uh, system, they have this, they are utilize this um, natural occurring uh, negative entropy change events. They try to utilize that, basically taking advantage of this entropy effect, uh -huh. able to utilize, attract the energy from a silver vibration of the protons. Okay, they usually will be negative, you know, they will let them, okay, but they will, if they are in the bulk, <laughs> No matter the crazy dance, they're not able to do the work. But if they're electrostatic and local surface, you have a high probability of keep that thing, right? That's really this data G, data G is for, right? okay? So it's really, it's very clear. It is the, uh, they are using um, environmental heat energy, actually isothermally because temperature is, you have a single T. There's no difference across memory, okay? So I hope everybody now get it. So this plot, I just convert that to free energy, you know, the proton motive force uh, convert to, you know, just plot as uh, give us free energy, right? Same thing, right? You see, it's the same pattern. Okay, so I just want to make sure that, you know, in biological, uh, bioenergetic, uh, bio we use the proton motive force, but in thermodynamic, everybody here in this audience probably more familiar with the uh, data G. So, okay, so you can see here, that's your total data G, that's a classic proton, uh, multi force theta G, that's your local PMS uh, free energy. So same thing, okay, right? Okay, I just make sure that clear. Now, so one thing I want to pay attention, you know, so in that case, how you can over break the glass ceiling? Now, I predict from this data, if this is correct, if my intervention correct, I would predict the structure. So this is a piece of, uh, biological membrane in your mitochondria, okay? You know, it's very similar to one in the bacteria, okay? But this one is like well different, everybody actually know, okay? I expect, so those are the respiration, for example, this system use NADH and, and um, uh, so electron from here, you know, all the way to here to go to oxygen and pump the protons, okay? Those are the proton pumps, okay? So I expect, the proton pumps the protein, you know, the exit should be like extended about one or three nanometers away from the membrane. Uh-huh. 
like this one here, this one here, they should they should sticking up into liquid. And the proton user, the mouth of it has like the ATP synthesis had to be stayed there, okay? Because otherwise, so they uh, now if this uh, now if this side is not sticking out, now if they were pumping against this layer, then you backfire. You see that right? Okay. So this is my prediction. That's why the how can they they can break the glass ceiling. So that means this system is symmetric. Remember that's keyword I discovered. Okay. So these two sides are not the same. Okay. If it's symmetric, you don't have a game. <laughs> you see the two sides are symmetric. That's really the key here. Okay. You see the membrane are symmetric biological membrane. So this came from Billings evolution. You know, these are predicted exactly. These now are the data from cryogenic electron microscopic data. This is true. It's not my cartoon. It's published here in the in this article. I dig it out. <laughs> Match exactly what are predicted. So I feel very confident what we discovered is real. Okay. So this came from Billings of evolution. It's in you and me. It's in the whole. Many or all organisms on Earth have that. So that's why top two process actually is in the past, we just did not know it. We now understand that. Okay. So because of time, I'm going to run a little fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this part, the present study, you know, with this uh, electro um, transmembrane electro local proton theory, my theory, has been better explained the decades long standing, you know, conjunct. Conjolum, okay, you know, the mystery of ATP synthesis in agrophagic bacteria. The calculated uh, uh, PMA curve matches uh, excellently well with observed population growth pattern. Okay, that's just uh, that. Now, more importantly, we will ask the thermal utilization of EMI heat energy with local proton at the liquid interface to do useful work driving ATP synthesis. Okay, it's real, okay. Yes, so it's about part of chemical five can amount of heat. Now that's the thing came from, I'll just talk about, okay, right? <laughs> and it's the uh, scientifically in this audience, most uh, interesting one is this uh, net entropy happens, okay? So this first time we really kind of demolish this. So this system also happens in, uh, in uh, our mitochondria, okay? So I'm gonna talk about that. So this is our body, mitochondria, okay? So those are well-resolved uh, structure. You have this inner membrane like this called the uh, crystal, okay? Now the ATP synthesis, actually, they're located on the tip of that, okay? Those are reviewed by cryogenic electron microscopic work. So people in the field cannot explain why they do that, you know? Why are these things localized so neatly on the tip here? We now have a theory here. So, so, for example, why mitochondria de develop the crystal? Now, I understand, first of all, the formation of a crystal creating more membrane in the membrane surface area because this is a protonic capacitor, right? The bigger, the more membrane surface area, you have more capacitor, capacitance, you're able to store more energy, right? <laughs> That's what they do there, right? That's one thing. But also, the story here, you know, you form this kind of structure called the crystal, you know, so you have membrane here, but you look at this thing here, there's another effect. For electrostatic, you have this, your proton concentration on the here, because this, uh, you know, this is a, uh, you have this special shape, okay? It's not round, okay? <laughs> crystal. Actually, this concentration is high here, so although um, the pump, your, your proton pump, I show actually in your multiple is here, so they're pumping at the lower concentration part of it, but electrostatically make it even higher. And that's why they're sitting there, they basically utilize the best way to utilize this you know, heat energy. You see that, right? This again came from beginnings of evolution, years of evolution, they are natural forming, okay? So this is another finding here, okay? This already published in the Nature's um, Research Journal Scientific Reports, okay, this work. And also we calculate the exchange effect for this bacteria, uh, for our uh, mitochondria in our body, okay? okay? That factor is, um, you know, the reduction factor. So we calculated from there, we calculated the mitochondria without crystal is here. With crystal, you have much more um, proton, local proton per mitochondria. That's evolutionally make that 
crystal formation have advantage, although you don't have to. You know, some of the bacteria may not have, but the more you have, you have more protons, local protons, right? So you can use the heat energy more, you see? So evolutionarily, they're making sense. So that's another piece. So also in this article, we discussed that. And more important, we check the energy for mitochondria. Okay, so I'm gonna, because of timing, um, the calculation is similar. Okay, so I'll calculate, in this case, I'll calculate the data is, okay, you know, with the membrane potential, those are uh, experimental, okay? And these are the cal calculated data from the little experiment. And you see the first time in numerical dimension, data is a negative number, okay? First time. So it's this case is locked, <laughs> okay? It's locked, it, it, it's a similar feature. And these are the data um, uh, G for your local component. This is the classic, the total is this. That's your, how much is needed for making ATP. That's your chemo, chemical uh, limit because all the chemical energy, see, the requirement is when, you know, higher than the chemical energy. Chemical energy cannot explain ATP making your body. Okay, that's basically that is. So I'm gonna, that's how the part is, okay? So that's your classic in your mitochondria from membrane potential in your body can from six, 60 to, you know, 200 milliwatts. And uh, so that's your classic uh, protonic free energy that's how much you require. So this, um, the classic uh, calculation really cannot explain how a mitochondria make ATPs. Now the local proton modes here way above that, that's your total. And that's your required uh, proton multiple. So our efficiency about 50 or 60%, you know, it's the day, so the system, they grab a significant heat energy, they use, you know, they use very freely. <laughs> They use very generously. <laughs> it's a lot of heat. It's also, so second law in that case applies very well. So don't say second law is long. We are not trying to take law. Yeah, so, so second law only uh, when in a free system. Yeah, you do. Uh -huh. But for the memory, you have a two-dimensional thing. You have a symmetric. Be careful. So second law that does not apply. Okay. So just that's type of B. Okay. Yeah, so I already show you this. So this is, you know, a symmetric thing. I just revisited. Okay. I showed you before. And now, uh, how this energy is exactly used? Remember that ATP is here? This is structure to dissolve. So let's look, you know, where this structure is, proton hard you use, you know? So remember that thing, okay? So this is the resolved structure. You see from this science paper, okay, right? So this is structure. So that's a liquid phase, okay? Your water here. So the proton actually come right here and drive this and turbine, making this and more and you drive ATP making, okay? Where the proton is that getting, you see, that's your liquid phase. Remember the local proton is right within this layer and there are thermal vibration. Remember you have a KT, right? If there's here, of course the proton is lateral, they don't have eye, they're bumping in and out. <laughs> but if it's there, they're gonna hit the thing, right? And hit it, they will turn them out, turn these uh, molecular turbines, make ATP, okay? And then, so that can summarize this. That's how that heat is utilized, okay? So ITP theory, uh, with its uh, newly formulated proton multiforce equation cannot fully elucidate energetic for so-called oxidative phosphor in mitochondria, okay? You know, for the whole membrane potential. This study has not revealed mitochondria can isothermally utilize environmental heat energy with ambient temperature, uh, in their case 37 C, okay, of um, the, the thermal kinetic energy of the proton, okay, of the local proton to perform useful work, drive synthesis ATP, convert uh, heat energy, part of heat energy. Of course, some of the energy came from chemical, okay, chemical energy as well. So local proton motor dominate the TMF and the mitochondria obtain as much as 70% of the free energy from this process. So mitochondria part of the including us are not only chemotrophic, remember we need the food, we are chemotrophic, okay? But we also have a thermotrophic feature. I saw so many utilize the environment heat energy, okay? To help ATP making. And here is my take home messages, okay? I'm going to probably stop here. <laughs> because of time, okay? <laughs> I can let you through this, okay? So basically what this thing here is, uh, the key message is that this uh, study review a uh, uh, thermal tracker feature, 
the biological uh, membrane system can isothermally utilize environment heat energy associated with ambient temperature, thermal motion kinetic energy of localized proton to perform useful work dry ATP making. And the local proton, protonic uh, free energy from isothermal environment heat utilization with TELP is expressed in this equation I showed earlier. It's not quite clear. There are two thermodynamic distinct type of energetic process naturally occurring on Earth. Type A is everybody familiar with. Type B, as example in my talk here, does not necessarily have to be constrained by the second law or into its special thermodynamic and spatial asymmetric function as I show in the membrane associated with the natural entropy change. So thank you. Okay, thank you, James. So um, let's begin with questions. Um, I'm going to check first on participants. Okay, there are a few hands, um, mm -hmm. I think. Okay, uh, Dr. Solomon, you're up again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, second time at bat. Uh, basically, my question is, this is great results. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, why haven't people discovered it before? I'd like to get your opinion as to why this happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like what, what, what goes on in your mind, it might not mm -hmm. be going on in their minds or constraints mm -hmm. that they have, that you don't have. But at mm -hmm. any rate, my main question is, has any of this been applied by the neuro people to create better models of neural transmission and stuff like that? Because our, our, my neuro group in this area has found it to be incredibly incorrect and lackluster and old time uh, ways of looking at uh, uh, neural structures. They don't even get into the, the, the sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. They don't get into any of that stuff as well as they should. And mm -hmm. I was wondering at your level, uh, you have a lot of stuff there that could be used in under, better understanding neural firings and transmission. And do you or any of your colleagues or follow on people have used this in their model? Yes, thank you, Robert, for your question. Yes, indeed. I already have a publication on uh, applying this funding to the neuron. Actually, it's so a friend, Elbow drinking water, okay? Drinking water, protonic conductor. Uh, Robert, the signal from your brain to your leg is one neuron inside the liquid. In our brain, in our body, there's no electronic circuit because the shortest, uh, the longest circuit is the mitochondrial <laughs> like the you know, like 30 nanometer or cannot form a circuit. What happened? So apply this one here is the, the water in the, you know, no long, uh, axon are very long, right? So like more than meter from your head um, is protonic signal. So I actually have already have publication just published about a year ago in Neurophysiology, actually, I already, uh, Robert, I can send the article for you. If you can send me an email, uh, email, so I will be able to forward my article. Yes, in fact, uh, from my work, also not covered here, our brain actually working on a protonic circuit, you know, as a neuron, all the neuron together, right? It's a, the actual potential is actual protonic signal because it's the memory potential, remember, is from, uh, is from, um, the protonic uh, you know, capacitance signal, right? The protonic capacitor, right? Okay. So in a sense, we now understand our brain and our neuron system. Yes, all the neural theory, because they always talk about sodium diffusion, they cannot explain how the conduction of a signal, they're too slow. The yeah, diffusion too slow. You know, diffusion of sodium is like very slow, right? Cannot explain, you know, how our, you know, our pace cell in the heart works and cannot explain, I'm talking very fast, you know, <laughs> my signal to my hand, to my muscle, okay, all right? But deficient, no way. But protonic conduction is very fast. That's why, yes, this have, uh, Robert, this has already applied into um, a neuron physio physiology. So I have, uh, uh, you know, already published that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's let's move on. Just, uh, just, just a real, uh, just a real quick comment back, if I may. Okay, uh, very quickly. What we're getting out, what we what also is ignored, is the fact that the water molecules are rotating. 
So you yes. get water, rotating water molecules, you obviously get magnetic moments and all sorts of coupling effects and whatever. Yes. And our work has shown that when you have high sodium content in a human being, mm -hmm. uh, very high sodium content via salty diet or whatever, that this mm -hmm. definitely affects the nature of the rotating water molecules mm -hmm. and it has impact on neurological function. But more of that perhaps some other time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Justin Coven. Hi, um, hmm. uh, James. Yeah. Uh, my question in regards to you were indicating that there's a, a there's pulling of heat from the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I don't know if that's an assumption or if you've you've had measurements of that of actually seeing the heat coming in from the environment as this process is happening. So, um, so the heat is right here. Justin, you see the RT, right? As I pointed out, R is the uh, uh, is the uh, KT, Boseman comes on KT times your Avogadro's number in A, right? So it's right there. Exactly explicitly tell you that. That's the energy you're getting from the environment. Is the is the KT is well known is the kinetic energy of the of the, you know, of the in this case the proton, you know, thermal uh, random thermal chaotic thermal motion, but when you that that the proton dancing around the mouth of that ATP sensor, you're gonna hit the thing. It's hot. I missed it. <laughs> so, so it's so, here. Yeah. So, so you know, there, yeah. there, there's a question of whether it's, um, you know, as was mentioned by Thomas Malone earlier. Yes. Um, is that energy coming from zero point, or is it coming from external and uh, you know heat from the environment? So you're you're showing that there there's something that's occurring here, and it yes. matches the patterns that are. Yes. You know, actually seen in the cells, you know, from yes. a capacitor perspective. So, so, you, yes. so you, there was some, you know, really solid stuff that seemed like you actually had experimental data yeah. behind it. But the question yeah. is, do you have something experimentally that's actually showing that there's some heat drop from the environment? Um, you know, uh, now it could be you're just talking, well, it's just normal diffusion of heat from the environment. And yeah. Yeah, so very good question. So this I'll go back to the when I was a student, uh, you see the year of 7982. Um, at that time, you know, this me, <laughs> so 40 years ago, when I was a student, <laughs> I I have an idea I want to explore whether you know the thermal traffic uh, um, type of um, metabolism is possible. So we actually did experiment with the heat. Uh, uh, absorption of um, thermophilic um, uh, bacteria. In this case, actually, is this bacteria, this uh, methanogen? Okay, we we enrich it. You know, that's like we done forty years ago, students. That's self is, is a great achievement. And then we put this in a reactor. We measure like this your know, culture with uh, is acetate medium. They fermented to um, so the organism. Okay. And they uh, metabolize making methane. They actually theoretically absorb heat. Okay, so but we want to test it, make sure they are really is true as you said. Okay, we predict they do. So this is control. So this lemma done. So this like a system you have a, a reactor here. You control. You compare the temperature difference. So this whole thing is in a thermal box. Okay, all right. So you control. Actually, we measure the heat uh, um, difference. Yes, they are temperature gradient. So this in Chinese. So just. Uh, uh, this is a temperature uh, difference. Yeah, they are absorb heat. So the temperature on your treatment is slightly lower, 0.1, uh, 0 0.1 C centigrade lower than your control consistently. We repeat four times. So we do observe the, the organism in this case, in the total system actually absorb heat from the environment. So thank you, Justin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any any other questions? This actually is this early expo uh, exploration. Actually, when this you know big curve came up, but was in chemical energy, that's in my bell. You know, the sign I'm looking for 40 years ago said, hey, James, your sign is right in front of you. Why don't you recognize it? And then, oh my gosh, this sign I'm looking for like 40 years ago finally came to me. I selected it <laughs> from the data. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Garrett. Mm -hmm. Um so this question is really perhaps more due to my ignorance of, of uh, 
these types of chemical processes. Mm -hmm. but I see that your reaction takes more than a thermal energy. That, that yeah. really proved quite clearly. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, where does that energy come from? Because in a, a this chemical soup, there are mm -hmm. many sources for the energy. So can it yes. can the energy be transferred from some other uh, chemical in the process to the the particular uh, uh, chemical that, that you're measuring? Yes. So, uh, 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 Professor Mao, that that's a very good question. So, in these bacterial metabolism, the net actually is absorbed heat, but in our body. We have other process, you know, like when eat a lot of food, we have oxygen, right? So this one does not use oxygen, okay? So they are, you know, kind of fermentation, right? They release less heat energy. So the total actually is absorbing. But in our body, we actually, so the, we still chemo trap. We eat food, we oxide. We also, you know, pumping protons. We release a lot of heat. So, mm -hmm. so, so there is a mix of the chemo trap. <laughs> Don't forget chemo trap. We are, we are not thermo trap, pure thermo trap, okay? <laughs> We are a mixture of the chemo of we release heat, but in the last step of the proton on the surface, grab a significant energy back. <laughs> so that's really the reason why, you know, for one uh, audience say why people did not discover because it's difficult because it's a mixture. <laughs> you have you have a chemical chemo of you release a lot of heat. That's why I maintain our body temperature 37, right? Of course, we are we are close. Sometimes we we try to take a hot shower, <laughs> make it warm. But in overall, actually, the chemical energy from our oxidation of food, we still release a lot of heat energy, but we grab them back. That's why um, our efficiency, our body's metabolism is so high. It's even related to the equation of why we are 37, why we are so difficult to lose weight, because the energy efficiency is just not like the second law applied, you know, like even 60% or 50% efficiency. <laughs> yes, the chemical part, yes. But the last part, whatever, can you come back? So the total energy is like closer to like 90% or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but it still is, you still produce heat. So we are actually in human, we, because we are oxidative, we are, we are hot organisms. <laughs> we make our body hot. We actually is, uh, have a lot of heat source from our oxidative process. You know, like when we pumping protons, but electron moles, and also the chemical reaction, you know, provide vibrations, you know, like in the, in the medium, we produce heat. So is that's why this is, this is uh, uh, that's why people you know uh, was wondering why biological systems sometimes have a, such a high efficiency, but we try to still explain by the co classic uh, way of explaining, <laughs> yeah. you know. But that's why the debate, you know. So now we understand. Oh wow, you actually have two cents going on. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Right. Well, James, to follow up on that, it, mm. I mean. I would assume metabolic studies have been pretty rigorous over the last hundred years to try to balance uh, heat production, waste production, um, right. CO2, water mm -hmm. production by organisms, human beings and other animals mm -hmm. against the intake of energy. And if 70% of energy is actually coming from the thermal bath, mm -hmm. how does that square in your mind with uh, metabolic studies that have been done over the last century? Now, if you measure the total as um, uh, Garrett just um, the question is, if you try to measure the total, you still have uh, the total process still release heat. So that because look, the second law is overload like a mythical. If you don't know it, I was thinking that second law still apply very well. Okay, right? So what happened was the heat release process actually is you know the thermal efficient uh, the energy efficiency is like about. 50 or 60, even like 30, you know, percent, you know, depend on status, okay, depend on what status. But that, that proton signs fetch a lot of come back. Mm -hmm. So your total still is not like this bacteria. This bacteria is special, okay, because they are <laughs> endolobic, okay. And that's why in this bacteria, you can measure they are the net heat absorbed, okay. But in human, we are net heat releasing. So that's why this thing is not apparent, okay. Okay. You got it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I think we're um, just about out of time. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, again, uh, uh, James, thanks very much for a really provocative and interesting talk. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Garrett for the next speaker, I believe. Okay. Thanks. Right. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, good. <laughs>